What role can faculty play in changing the national conversation about campus dialogue? Two questions in one. First, what national conversation or conversations are we talking about? Second, what role or roles can faculty play? I'll take these questions one at a time, but first, let me tell you where I'm coming from. No, I'm not indulging in today's identity parade, positioning myself by race or sex or gender identity or religion or sexual orientation. But I'm going to play the age card. At 89, that's one of the few cards I got left. And it's relevant to today's discussion because age rhymes with experience. And three aspects of my personal journey inform what I'm going to say. First, three decades as an academic historian. Second, in 1994, I took early retirement and for the past three decades, have been a diversity lecturer and consultant. This has included visiting more than 350 college campuses, but has also involved working with entities outside of academia where conversations can be quite different. Third, in 2018, I became an inaugural fellow of the University of California National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. For the past five years, I've been studying the half century intersection of the diversity movement and the idea of free speech. So when I think about national conversations, I view them not just as a scholar, but also from the perspective of one who rumbles, tumbles, and fumbles with dialogue in multiple circumstances. From working with campus residential life departments, to training federal government leaders, to consulting with private business, to advising on scripts for children's television. As a result, I don't see one national conversation about campus dialogue. I see multiple conversations. Three types stand out. First, there are academic conversations, not just among professors, but also involving administrators, staff, and students. Second, there are commentariat conversations, such as those involving media pundits who comment about colleges and universities. Those conversations are quite different in style and motivation since they focus on capturing and trying to influence a non-academic audience of readers and listeners. This brings us to the third type of conversation, semi-interested observer conversations about higher education. The day-to-day -day conversations of intelligent people who are part of neither academia nor the media commentariat, people who vote, go to school board meetings, or support or oppose politicians who make decisions and public proclamations about what's happening on college campuses. So professors need to decide which of these three conversations they want to change, one, two, or all three. This may influence the ideas you propound, the arguments you present, and certainly the language you adopt. In particular, Ideas, arguments, and language that seem to work within the academic echo chamber may not be as successful when addressing media influencers or interested listeners in the broader public. Now, I have no secret formula for influencing national conversation, but I will suggest four types of conversation influencing strategies. To make these strategies easier to remember, I'll root them mnemonically in a single four-letter word, DARE, D-A-R-E. First, D, depolarize. Faculty should try to depolarize conversations, including conversations about campus dialogue. That means swimming upstream, particularly in today's conversational ecology. American society is replete with forces that contribute to and feed off polarization institutional forces, social forces, governmental forces, political forces, certainly media forces where many members of the commentariat have built and sustained careers by polarizing. But let's start with you. Ask yourself, have I ever said, we need to look at both sides of the issue? If you have, you're probably a card-carrying member of the polarization mob. 
even if unintended. John Dewey referred to such both sides framings as pernicious dualisms. By their very dualistic nature, they polarize dialogue, encouraging people to place themselves on one side or the other, right or left, blue or red, conservative or progressive, racist or anti-racist, pre-trans or trans, pro-trans or transphobic, woke or anti-woke. Are there issues in which there are only two sides? Sometimes, but not all that often. Life's too complicated for that. So to change conversations, avoid the both sides trap. When you encounter an issue, follow the rule of three. Provide a third perspective. Frame the issue as having three or more perspectives, not a mushy middle ground between two poles, but multiple perspectives from unexpected angles. By undermining comfortable knee-jerk polarities, you've taken the first step in changing conversations. Take the current movement to demand, demand divisive concepts from college campuses. In the last two years, state legislatures have enacted laws and, uh, and school boards have passed resolutions opposing the teaching of divisive concepts. For example, any idea that can be linked to the concept of critical race theory. Once a concept can be publicly packaged as divisive, it becomes a target for being barred from dialogue. Now notice the implicit dualism. Divisive concepts are bad. Non-divisive concepts are good. Reminds me of Polonius in Hamlet who pro proudly proclaimed that he was in favor of all of the good things and opposed to all of the bad things. When it comes to campus dialogue, reject the dualism of divisive concepts. Depolarize it. Present concepts as difficult, challenging, or provocative. But don't accept the idea that such concepts need to be divisive. Quite the contrary. One of higher education's goals should be to help students learn to employ constructive dialogue when dealing with challenging concepts. So let's move to the second step of DARE, amend. To change national conversations, you need to amend think, thinking by nudging it, clarify ideas, inject nuance, and create concept, context. Now this can be tricky. When speaking to people outside of academia, resist the tendency to speak down to listeners or readers. When you amend by judging, do it with the air of helping a friend or a relative to better understand, not of pontificating to the supposedly uninformed. Albert Einstein, once said that you can never understand a subject well until you could explain it to your grandmother. Oh, okay. That statement contains hints of ageism and sexism. But basically, Einstein was on target. Particularly when you venture forth into public conversations, you need to be able to explain your ideas clearly to intelligent non-specialists, like my grandmother. Whenever I prepare to speak to a non-academic audience. I focus on discussing my ideas with my grandmother, discussing my ideas with her, not explaining them to her. My savvy immigrant grandmother who didn't finish elementary school. She didn't have a huge vocabulary, but she was smart as hell. I always read my penultimate drafts aloud and try to imagine how they might reverberate with her even though she departed this earth nearly four decades ago. Most important, if you want to reach public observers or even the commentariat, don't address them as academics. Save your jargon and your references and your academic tropes or campus settings. Try to convince intelligent non-specialists and let academics come along for the ride. For example, we need to amend public thinking about the relationship of campus dialogue to two concepts, freedom of speech and academic freedom. I examined this conundrum in my UC National Institute research project, and I'm continuing in my book in progress on the historical intersection of diversity and speech. In his book, Safe Spaces, Brave Spaces, Diversity and Free Expression and Education, 
Former Harvard Law Professor John Fal Palfrey sought to amend thinking by stating simply, quote, the First Amendment is often assumed to do something that it does not, to grant people an affirmative right to free expression to all people. Now, I'm involved in many public conversations about freedom of speech, and the false assumption described by Palfrey complicates them. The First Amendment, quote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, unquote, does not guarantee free speech. Rather, it creates a wall between government and the individual. It does not prohibit private speech restraining activities. As it turns out, even the wall against government restraints is porous. Further complicating discussions of free speech is that there is no general agreement about what it means. In fact, it is used in at least four quite distinct ways. You can help amend your target audience's conversation by distinguishing these ways. First, casual street talk, like, I believe in free speech. What about my free speech? Offhanded, relatively mindless, no harm, no foul, right? Well, not really, because people sometimes act on the mistaken idea that their speech is free and then suffer the consequences. Second, Free speech as virtue signaling. People feel compelled to continually invoke free speech to let others know they're on the side of the angels. This often creates inconsistencies when it comes to campus dialogue. For example, some diversity trainers teach about microaggressions in order to change the way people speak. Then they signal their virtue by adding that heaven forbid, they aren't suggesting that people should self-censor. Of course they want people to self-censor. That's why they teach about microaggressions. Third, the aspirational ideal of free speech as analyzed and debated by scholars. In fact, this ideal sometimes leads to free speech supremacism. That is, free speech as the supreme value from which good inevitably emanates, a value that must be defended at all costs even if it clashes with other important values or leads to horrendous real world consequences. Finally, free speech as used in discussions of the First Amendment. Now, free speech supremacists support the First Amendment, but not all First Amendment defenders support absolute free speech supremacy. They may be passionate in opposing government interference with speech, but in situations where the First Amendment does not apply, that is, when not prohibiting government action, many First Amendment supporters defend non-governmental speech restraints in the pursuit of such goals as equity and inclusivity. Now, as a former journalist and as someone who lived for nearly two years under a military dictatorship, I am delighted that the Constitution provides protections against government interference with speech. But let's not overstate what the First Amendment does. To change conversations, you need to amend thinking about the First Amendment, freedom of speech, and their relationship to campus dialogue. That brings us to a companion dialogue influencing factor, academic freedom, imported and codified by the American Association of University Professors in 1915. Yet, being codified by the AAUP has not translated into total agreement about what academic freedom is, even among academics. Now, when I started my current book project, I thought I knew what academic freedom meant. But once I got into the academic freedom literature, I discovered how much disagreement exists, even among academic freedom specialists. And when I began examining individual campus controversies, I found that even major pro-academic freedom organizations disagree about what they consider to be breaches of academic freedom. Now, add the embattled relationship between academic freedom and freedom of speech, including when it comes to campus dialogue. Is academic freedom a special dimension of freedom of speech? Are academic freedom and freedom of speech separate but compatible ideas? Or ideas that inevitably come into conflict? 
Though many supporters of academic freedom oppose the idea that college campuses, particularly campus classrooms, are free speech zones. Some scholars argue that academic freedom is actually antithetical to campus free speech because professors rightfully establish and enforce restrictive rules for classroom discourse, research papers, and examinations, all expressions of speech. To further complicate our challenge, consider the difference between public and private institutions of higher education, which are not bound by the same federal constitutional limitations as public universities. So when trying to change national conversations about dialogue, there are plenty of ideas that you can amend. But don't stop with amending. Take the next and third dare step, R, reframe. Depolarizing and amending can help us calm and modif the modestly clarify national conversations. But fundamentally changing these conversations requires a thoughtful, compelling reframing of what dialogue means, as contrasted, for example, with debate, shouting, accusing, or simply expressing opinion. Now, reframing is not easy for at least three reasons. First, it requires questioning your own thinking, including the frames you may have become, that may have become fundamental to how you view the world. Second, it demands the creation of frames that may compel others to rethink the way they view dialogue, particularly campus dialogue. And third, it requires coming up with effective language to communicate these ideas in a clear and compelling manner. Not arguments you're accustomed to making in the friendly environs of academic echo chambers like this gathering. Rather, new frames that have the potential for influencing those who are not specialists who, and who may not lean in your direction. For example, if you want to make a public argument based on academic freedom, you're going to need to clearly frame the idea of academic freedom and convince the public of its importance. Recognize that there is plenty of public cynicism about the idea of academic freedom. Some of the broader public view academic freedom as basically an example of professorial narcissism and self-serving privilege. Academic freedom is not an easy public sell. Let me give you two examples of academic reframing. In the May 15th, 2023, Inside Higher Ed, law professor Deepa Dasa Acevedo reframed the idea of tenure in an article entitled, In the Battle for Tenure, Words Matter. To effectively defend the idea of tenure, the article argues we need to reframe it by discarding terms like job for life and permanent position, which make faculty sound like they're no more than a special interest group. Instead, reframe tenure as just cause employment, which is not unique to university faculty. Now, you may not agree with the article, but I found that to be a fine example of an effort to reframe in order to convince. Or take a personal example. When I began my National Center project, the diversity speech conversation had become polarized. Free speech was a blessed given, and diversity was a monolithic opponent, sometimes labeled as political correctness, or snowflake, or wokeness, or cancel culture. The depolarized I needed to reframe three ideas, free speech, academic freedom, and the concept of diversity as a monolithic juggernaut. To do that, I deconstructed diversity, reframing it as consisting of five sometimes conflicting threads, interculturalism, equity and inclusion, managerialism, critical theory, and therapeutics. Now, all five of these threads approach the speech environment as something that needs to change. However, each thread has its special goals and strategies when it comes to speech modification. I'll briefly look at three of those threads. You can find an analysis of all five in my article uh, on the symposium website. The interculturalist thread began with the goal of creating 
better communications among people from different world cultures. But in the 1970s, it began to expand its horizons to include domestic differences. And when it comes to dialogue, interculturalism emphasizes the idea of voluntary speech restraint. That is, people should learn to voluntarily modify their speech to better communicate and with and show respect for those of other backgrounds. But isn't such voluntary action a form of self-censorship? Of course. That's why I defend the idea of self-censorship, framing it the way my folks did as common courtesy. Parallel to interculturalism stands the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion, a strand rooted in the civil rights movement of the 1960s, but whose buzzwords did not begin to emerge sequentially until the 1970s. Now, in some respects, equity and inclusion advocates draw upon the ideas and language of interculturalism. For example, in cultural competence training and in K-12, multicultural education. However, inclusionists are also more concerned with issues of equity, including inequities within speech. This might include establishing ground rules before engaging in dialogue, not trusting on volunteerism alone to create and preserve the desired ambience for successful dialogue. But when it comes to erecting guardrails for dialogue, inclusionists are wimps compared to the therapeutic wing of the diversity movement. This strain too has historical roots. In 1980, the American Psychiatric Association officially recognized PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. The idea of trauma ultimately penetrated diversity thinking. Some diversity trainers now conduct what they call trauma-informed workshops. And not just individual trauma, it even be passed down as intergenerational trauma. Moreover, those traumas can be triggered. How? Among other things, by speech, as in campus dialogues. And since traumas can be triggered, professors, workshop presenters, and dialogue leaders are urged to include trigger warnings in their materials. Or consider equity language lists. Now, these often do a commendable job of identifying language inequities, but sometimes shoot themselves in the foot by providing cumbersome and even risible alternative wording, which are easy to criticize or parody. By reframing diversity as a series of sometimes contending strands, I try to undermine the perception of diversity as a monolith. By illuminating how each strand addresses the issue of speech, I challenge the diversity in speech as a dualistic polarity, but rather provide multiple perspectives on diversity speech tensions. I find this approach works well with the interested public and even with some of the common area, uh, as well as with academic audiences. Now this brings me then to the final dare step in changing national conversations about campus dialogues. Beyond depolarizing, amending and reframing, we need to do E, excite. If dialogue is a valuable part of the academic journey, we need to make it sound exciting. You won't change public conversation by making dialogue sound tedious. Like George Bernard Shaw's depiction of English education as a system created to train the English people to do dull tasks. To excite, you need to address fundamental questions. What is so important about campus dialogue? Why should I support the kind of dialogue you are proffering? What does such dialogue contribute to individuals? And how can this contribute to our society? But let me take it one step further. You're not going to create excitement by championing dialogue as a bland, bland exercise in dedicated neutrality. The pursuit of neutrality is a fool's errand. CNN has been trying to stake out that position with disastrous results in both content and viewership. Remember the words of Mark Twain, who once asked a friend where he stood on a highly contentious issue. The friend answered 
and he was neutral on that topic. To which Twain responded, then whom are you neutral against? Vibrant dialogues are not an exercise in neutrality. Rather, they should encourage students to make strong cases for their positions while simultaneously listening to others and remaining open to alternative ideas. The National Council for the Social Studies is pursuing this goal in its proposed new statement of purpose. Quote, social studies help students to navigate the world by exploring the past, participating in the present, and looking toward the future, social studies prepares learners for a lifelong practice of civil discourse and civic engagement in their communities and the world. And NCSS has developed a program to help teachers address concepts that have been targeted by state legislatures and school boards. Which brings me back to the dreadfully wrong-minded idea of banning divisive concepts. The defense of campus dialogue should include the passionate argument in favor of addressing difficult concepts, maybe potentially divisive concepts. We should not be wishy-washy about it. If you ban complex and challenging ideas, then you've deprived students of the opportunity to hone their capacities for dealing with these concepts without retreating to divisiveness. So let me end with T.S. Eliot, who wrote, we had the experience, but missed the meaning. To change national conversations, faculty need to provide new and exciting meaning to the story of the future of higher education, in which robust and inclusive campus dialogue plays a central role. That's it. That was a word. Awesome. <laughs> There's so much to unpack there. First, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done um, in this area and, you know, for basically blazing a trail and to continuing on. Um, I, I wanted to drop the acronym that you shared in the chat uh, so that we can kind of go back to that. Sure. But, you know, the dare, depolarize, amend, reframe, and excite. Uh, but another point that you made early on, which I think was even more important, uh, significant to get the conversation going is recognizing the different audiences, um, the academic and the sense of you know, faculty, the commerce, which, you know, in some case can be strewed as the mainstream media and anybody who's offering commentary around this area, um, and in some cases includes now social media, um, and, you know, and how that works out, because one thing we're also seeing is even as social media gives everyone an opportunity to kind of frame in and provides, there's also differences in different platforms um, between Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, the state university system in Florida recently banned TikTok on university campuses, and I know, you know, similar efforts in other states. So I uh, would like to kind of go off and opening up to the audience in terms of we want to break down with each of the acronyms um, in terms of the first one, depolarize. Um, and what that means for some of those that are, are in their context of their own organizations or what they've seen. Are there other uh, areas? One thing um, I noticed, I'll go back to Nathan's comment in the chat, mentioning that there's no sides in dialogues. Um, and I see Thomas, your hand as well. Thanks. I, th I thought uh, since you were asking, I thought I would I'd try to chime in. So I'm, I'm interested in um, Carlos and the uh, on the theme of depolarization and yeah. to connect that with your comments about neutrality at the end. That you said um, it, it's a mistake for institutions to try to be neutral, um, and there's a sense in which I agree with that. But I noticed that you move very quickly from the institution or the faculty member to the students, that students should not be neutral. I agree with that part. But as a teacher, if I walk into a room and I say, um, I hate Republicans, that is a typical, that's a bad way of getting a conversation going. That's not being neutral. That might be my actual opinion. Um, isn't that, isn't the, the role of the faculty member to be a kind of um, arbiter or an umpire rather than a, a, a cheerleader for a particular team? Um, can you talk about that? 
if you if you frame it in a polar manner, which you just did, the answer is no, no. Uh, let's go for a third. Let's you know, might take. Let's go. Might take. I would move and say take a rule of three. There are moments when I'm going to want to be the arbiter among things. Yeah, uh, arbiter and in respect of alternative kinds of views coming forth. Uh, this doesn't make me neutral. It means I've taken a firm position for a certain kind of facilitating of the conversation that's going on. And that's not very neutral because I've chosen the, my ground rules for how I'm going to facilitate. And so I'd say there are m multiple perspectives on the way you do that. And, and I would say, I, I didn't say that. I don't think I said that, is, and I hope I, I hope I didn't flub it. I didn't say that institutions should be neutral. I said that neutrality is just a horrible position in a general sense. And there may be certain cases where, where you would use neutrality in a very in a very specific way, but not as a, should I say, as a default position. And Thomas, I hope I'm not being too wishy-washy about that. No, I think that's a really good point. Um, earlier this year at Florida International University, we had a, a controversy of our own uh, where there was a professor coming uh, to the Cuban Research Institute to talk about immigration. And of course, after some backlash, mainly from the public, they decided to add a counter speaker. Um, it quickly <laughs> delved into chaos uh, in this event, but, and again, trying to provide that counterweight, whether or not it actually allowed uh, an actual dialogue or conversation to, to occur. Um, and, and so when we talk about these dialogues, and I know uh, wanting to, again, go back to, to Laura and just thank her as well for connecting us, um, Carlos, and having this opportunity and going back to the National Student Dialogue, where we talk about wanting to facilitate these dialogues among students, um, but then our roles as faculty members to be able to have these, you know, dialogues amongst ourselves, but then also within the larger communities in which we operate. Yeah, you know, it's, it's important you made about your campus. It's right away, we have a speaker. Let's get a counter speaker. Okay. That is an invitation to polarize. That's exactly what it is. It's a, like, as opposed to let's get three angles on this topic. Notice the rule of three. Move away from the, the uh, to move into the three. Uh, and it's, it's the trap, it's the polarization trap, the duality trap that smart people and smart institutions do all the time. And then they get upset. They find, oh my gosh, the atmosphere is polarized. Dude, you helped them do it by the very structuring of the way you approach the, the, the event or the topic or whatever. Laura? This feels like a nice narrative arc back to our first session yesterday, in which our keynote, uh, our colleague Ron Elving mentioned this idea of, you know, it would be a good format for some events, particularly controversial ones, if there were, if they were framed as either more like debates or more like counterpoints between two positions. And it, it, I've really been thinking about that a lot. I think because of coming out of being an activist, um, I immediately went to the worst case scenario. <laughs> What's the worst thing that could happen? And the thing that I thought was you could almost troll with that by saying, okay, I am going to declare certain topics to be controversial. And so, you know, it's not just that the proud boy will need a counterpart, but the speaker from the uh, state chapter of the NAACP or, um, you know, uh, I don't know, um, the, the campus chaplain in the, in the campus rabbi, you know, needs a counterpoint. Um, always thinking of what a bad person can do. Um, but that, that is, you know, that raises a problem. So I was thinking, you know, I can imagine a campus having a brutal knockdown drag out fight about what is controversial, what needs to be treated as controversial. We've seen things related to Israel and Palestine that definitely 
um, go that way. But one can imagine saying, well, you know, everything is controversial. Um, so I'm wondering in, in, in combination with this problem of, well, two sides isn't as many sides as we have, um, what might be an alternative model for, you know, for, for fulfilling that, that idea of, of, of responding to speech you don't like with more speech as opposed to with censorship? You're asking me? Yeah, well, maybe the whole group, but generally Carlos- well, I'd love anyone else to, to jump in on this too. <laughs> but uh, but you know, I'll go back to, you know, I'll, I tend to try to simplify things, make every, everything, another Einstein, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. Uh, and that could lead to some uh, very simplistic statement. So I'll be simplistic. Use the rule of three. If you see, if you see two setting up, go three. Just is an automatic thing. Uh, the, so let's say here's a topic. You want to speakers on two sides of the topic. Now that might be a perfect from an intellectual standpoint. Say that's really neat. We can have two sides. Look at this topic. This way. At that level of, if you're only talking about the discussion about that topic. However, if you're talking about the larger issue of am I contributing to campus and societal and mindset polarization, you're doing that. You, are, you may have done a very fine thing of having two people debate a topic, but in the larger picture, you're contributing to polarization, duality thinking. Own it. That's all I can say. I, I'm willing to contribute to polarization because I think on this topic, I want two people to really contend about it. Okay, fine. Just own the fact that you're a contributor to polarization. Don't whip out on it and give me some crap about, oh, well, it's academic freedom, free speech. We want multiple perspectives, viewpoint diversity. That's all that crap. That's just escapism. The idea, own the fact that you're a polarizer. That's okay. Live with it. I think Elizabeth makes a really good comment in the uh, chat that sometimes the biggest takeaway, though, is the con biggest controversies over what is and is not controversial. Um, and we're kind of seeing that, again, firsthand here in Florida, and that depending on who you ask, um, even legislators who are passing legislation related to critical race theory, um, again, depends on who you ask, you're going to get a different definition of it. Um, indoctrination, uh, woke, um, there's all these terms that, again, depending on who you ask, um, you're getting de different definitions. Um, and so the controversies end up being, you know, over the definitions of what we're arguing over in some cases. Yeah, by the way, you raise it. I mean, look, to go back to the topic of my, how do you influence national conversations? Since the, 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 the debates over critical race theory, which are really, in a public sense, only three years old, I had, my first, I had my first major confrontation with someone in the public addressing me about critical race theory uh, only about two and a half years ago. So it's, it's really not, it's a, it's a new story. What's happened is, the non-specialists in the commentariat have taken over that conversation on what is critical race theory. Academics have responded in the dumbest ways possible by producing academic tomes, which only other academics can understand, explaining and defending critical race theory. Wonderful within our discourse community, totally meaningless in terms of reaching those other two community conversations. And so which are the commentary and the interested public. And until defenders of critical race theory or explainers of critical race theory or framers of critical race theory can learn to explain it to my grandmother, they're losers. They've got to be able to explain critical race theory to my grandmother. And it's part of the fact that I, can, I, I do it. I do, I do it publicly. Yeah, and I think about how you've mentioned earlier the framing of the messaging, um, that it's got to be concise, clear, correct, but also in the sense constructive. 
Um, I teach an under integrative seminar um, for public policy and service for our undergraduate bachelor's degree. And when I first started teaching that class 10 years ago, I had them writing the 20 page research paper. And recently I've changed it to one page policy briefs. Their presentations are three minutes, like they're in front of a city council or commission and an infographic um, in the sense that really getting them to think about, um, for the most part, if they're gonna be public administrators, they're gonna be dealing with people with very short attention spans. Um, they're not writing for other academics. They're not writing for academic journals unless they go on for a PhD. But for the majority of our undergraduate and our master's degrees, they're working in local government, they're working in nonprofits. Um, sometimes they're giving snippets to the media. They have to be able to explain it in very concise and clear language. Um, and I think that's where the disconnect sometimes has been happening. Yeah. Yeah, and Abby, let me give me an example. So we took a critical race theory that you mentioned. One of the things, and in fact, in some of the laws passed, they've even pointed to intersectionality as a no-no, a divisive concept, can't teach it, bar it, ban it, blah, 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 blah. I go out and I use intersectionality in my public presentations, in public meetings, in private business, all the time. I don't sit and quote Ibrahim Kendi. I don't quote Kimberly Crenshaw and all that. I explain it in simple terms. I am getting no negative feedback at all. People understand when you explain intersectionality, take the take the trouble to, to you know, I won't say bring it down, lift the language out of the academic gutter and get it into a powerful public sense, it's understandable and people can relate to it, including very conservative people. So it's, 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 it's being willing to raise the level of your language to reach my grandmother. That's a, Never consider an academic gutter, but- It's an really. academic gutter. It's wonderful for a discourse community in term, it's an academic gutter in terms of communicating with people outside of academia. We have, I mean, I, I, look, I've been here for two days listening to this. I'm part of this discourse community. I've loved it, I've learned, it's been terrific. Three fourths of it wouldn't resonate one iota with folks outside of academia. And that actually kind of leads but perfectly to the other. Um, they couldn't <laughs> understand what we're talking about. We're referring to bodies and spaces and come on folks. Now they're the doesn't understand that jargon and those hopes. And so you're gonna, if you want, I mean, the, I, I've been asked to, I, Lara, if you're angry at me now, that's fine. Lara asked me to speak on this topic, okay? Reaching the chain, the national conversation. I've got to say, you've got to liberate yourself from academic language in order to affect conversations other than within academia. Now, if you remember, I said at the very beginning, that all you want to do is influence other academics. Stay with your jargon, stay with your tropes, stay with it, uh, your references, fine. Well, you want, to, you want to move into that next level of the commentariat and the interested public, you've got to retool. You can't play basketball skills. Hi, I'm Jess. I'm at the University of Michigan. I just graduated with my master's um, in public policy. Um, I took a 10-year break from school. I actually am a design major. So me going into policy was really out of a necessity for communities like mine back in California who are plagued by um, climate change and other disasters. Um, so it was really my sense of urgency to figure out the, the way of the land. And um, my hometown where I'm from, where I grew up was, is actually a very Trump centered area. And for three years doing community work and talking with people um, from different perspectives was very enlightening and how my communication shifted and evolved over time. And I think to your point, um, going back into academia after that time, it was it was kind of mind blowing for me um, of, of how much people were so intelligent, but were not able to have clearly have not communicated with people on a ground level. And I think universities are really missing that point of, 
of being able to articulate with community. So I'm just piggybacking off of what you're saying. I think it's really important. Um, and I've had to evolve the way that I communicate with people in academia the same way that I had to evolve with people from completely different perspectives on a ground level basis. And I don't I don't know how academia like tries to facilitate that with its students, but I think especially in these sort of spaces of, of policy, it's so critical um, because oftentimes in classes, it felt like we were talking about all of these communities as if they are so far removed. Same with the problems when in reality, it's it's every single day, it's very close. It's within one another. And I felt like that's also what created a lot of tension between students um, and also self-censoring um, within different dialogues in class. So I really appreciate that, what you were mentioning. Thank you. Jess, what, what city was it? Um, I'm I'm from Chico, California. Oh, Chico. oh yeah. Oh, so sure. very close to Paradise. Oh no, I know Chico very well. I've spoken to Chico State a number of times, yeah. And I think that perfectly radiates um, the acronym depolarize, amend, reframe, and excite. Um, but I think also something that she'd mentioned is, you know, keeping in mind the, the context of the communities that we're working in um, and not ignoring the, like I said, I, I don't know how much of you guys saw in the national media with yesterday in Miami and downtown with the index. Um, again, these are two sides that are never going to see eye to eye in many ways. Um, but again, we can think about how um, we can at least maintain some civility, <laughs> ideally, um, you know. I, so I Jenny, see, I see your hand. Do I see Jenny's hand up? Or? Oh, sorry. I always forget that my little camera has to pop up. Hi, Jenny. Yes, okay. Hi, um, I wanted to mention as part of reframing too, I think part of what we have to do is to get away from viewing these questions about free speech and DAI as simply legalistic questions um, and to be able to have conversations about um, what we can do that are not legal solutions or policy solutions, but are other ways to counteract negative um, expression that happens on our campuses around DEI issues um, that are, you know, that give the students more agency to do things without them. Because I have noticed on our campus, at least the, the initial reaction from students is always, the administration should do something or there should be a policy against or whatever. And, and I, for First Amendment reasons, oftentimes those things can't happen, but to give them some additional ways of thinking through how they might be able to respond, I think is is an important part of that reframing you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, Jenny, thank you. And I think I think once we've got, gotten through the amending part, you know, just it, little nudgings here and there, is that digging in deeply and saying, how can I reframe this in a manner which really moves the conversation, not just dabbles at the edges? That's when that's when that's where the action is. Yeah. And so I I and that, and by the way, this is tough stuff because it, it, when you do that, you probably find that you're disagreeing with yourself or maybe the yourself that existed two days ago. And that's not always fun. Because it, 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 that's why I hate, I hate it when someone, I get something from one of these academia, uh, whatever, saying you've just been quoted, someone cited your article. It was an article I wrote 30 years ago. I mean, I might believe just the opposite today. So when you reframe for the public, you're actually reframing yourself too. So be willing to recognize that when you address removal of the Republic and reframe for the Republic, for the public, you're probably changing yourself. You're probably putting yourself on a different journey than you were, than you thought you were on. I see. Yeah, I see you. There. Oh, hi. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your talk. So my question is zooming out a little bit from the DARE acronym. So we've got depolarize, amend, 
reframe, and excite. And my question is, to what end, in your view, um, what do you think are the most important goals of the kind of action-oriented framework you've given us today? Um, I mean, for many people, I think in the dialogue and deliberation space, po polarization, affective polarization is, um, is, is the, is the central end, but maybe that doesn't have to be, maybe that's misguided. I just want to know what you think is the kind of family of key ends toward which we should be working. Mm, see, you're, you're asking me to go on the journey with you. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. That's a great one, question. And I, I just wrote down two words in response to it. And the words are equitable inclusion. Almost everything I do is about greater inclusion, but equitable inclusion. Because I think what we're at the point right now in the world, and certainly in our society, that the, there is a greater willingness to include but a lesser willingness to include equitably. In other words, you're welcome, but on my rules. And I think there's a paradigm shift taking place, which is a challenge to, that's a bigger thing, which is I'm welcome. You, you shouldn't be in the power, have the power to tell me how I can be included. I want to be included in an equitable sense. Now that's a little babbly on my part, and I apologize for that. But I think there's something deeper. Why, as I've listened to the last two days when people talked about dialogues and all that, it was always about ultimately inclusion. But how do we include in a way that isn't a token inclusion, that isn't a you accept my rules inclusion? but an inclusion in which everybody brings their authentic self to the dialogue and to the participation on, I mean, this we're talking about participation on campus is not, are you, are you included off campus? Are you included equitably on campus? And as a part of stuff that's going on, or as a member of the faculty, or as a part of the administration, uh, by the way, if you're interested, and I, I, I didn't post that, uh, last fall, the U.S. Department of Energy asked me to give their keynote address for their Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, and they said, give a talk on Hispanics. And they said, but our theme this year is inclusivity. Uh, so I want you to talk about Hispanics within the theme of inclusivity. So I used that. I said, okay, let me, what am I going to do? It was like preparing for this talk. Lara threw me a curve and said, talk about something I've never talked about before. The dare thing I invented was just for this talk. Okay. And I, and, and I gave my whole talk around the idea using Latinos as, I don't use Hispanic, I use Latino as the, as my fulcrum. And I compared authentic inclusivity with uh, what is equitable inclusivity as opposed to uh, token inclusivity. And in, in, in writing that talk, I changed my own thinking about inclusivity. And, and so when you ask me the question, what, why, what are we driving at? That's become a, more, a, a basic moral ethical position I've taken as a larger goal beyond dialogue for dialogue's sake. And I'm sorry if that's a badly answer, but that's that to me is 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 an essential moral position that I've really grabbed onto for, in the last year. Is there time for a quick follow-up? I don't know what the conventions are. Um, it's, your, I, it's, it's your, I, uh, you're my <laughs> friend, Sarah. I'm gonna pre-up every, I, I knock out everybody out of the box. Yeah, follow up, please. I, so I I love your answer but I have one concern about it, which is sure. that in a perfect world, if, if we got all the inclusivity we were after, I think there are still open questions about whether the 
the culture that we have on campuses or the um, decision making processes that we have um, in in on campuses or in state legislatures or you know in our institutions broadly speaking whether they're actually having the type of effect that we want or whether they're functioning according to the right principles of of justice and so so we could get all the inclusion that we want but there's still further questions i think regarding the kind of goals of dialogue and deliberation um I say yes, but, and I would take one step, we're not gonna get all the time. Equitable inclusivity is a moving target. And I think the point is, is as we move toward, and this is where I think critical race theory is so important. See, it says, hey, there are some institutional levels for things. It's not just an interpersonal thing. It's not about me, just me and my authenticity. It's I'm operating within institution society. And, I hate to play the age card, but I will. 89 years, I'm not going to solve those problems. You know, there's an old statement, this is the difference between taking a problem seriously and taking a solution seriously. So my answer is, there are no solutions. We're on a journey, and all we can hope is that we make the journey better for those who come after us. And when I say come after you, uh, I, I don't want to be ageist, but I think you're a little bit younger than I am, Sarah. And, and, I, and I'm saying, is what I'm doing today going to help Sarah tomorrow? And I'm not going to be around. I'm not going to be around to see it. So, so what I do, I feel messianic about it. Not that I'm going to see that. Ah, now is the perfect world I've been working for. But maybe I push, I push things a little bit down the road for the Sarahs of the world, and my and my six grandkids. I mean. That, uh, and my one great grandchild. So, so I think you have to take the long view that you're not going to be around to see Eden and paradise and live. With it. That's all. I'll take it as a call for action. <laughs> it's a call. It's a call for eternal action. Knowing your uh, uh, my favorite all time uh, all time uh, philosopher playwright uh, Samuel Beckett put, summed it up in six words. Uh, said. Uh, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. So all I can do is invite you on a journey of failing better, that's all. I can't do any better than that. No, I really appreciate these conversations um, and just being so candid. Um, in March 2020, FYU launched an equity action initiative you know, in following the protests of, of 2020, which eventually led to the creation of our diversity, di diversity, equity, inclusion, which is now threatened under current legislation, whether or not we can actually have a division, diversity, equity, inclusion. But, you know, from that initiative, so many other, um, it became a catalyst for so many other actions that it's like, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And I, I think a lot of these things, there's the pendulum swinging them, we make some progress and then we take some step backs, but I like to think there's still always kind of a forward progressive motion, um, you know, that there's certain steps, even though it seems like we're taking some steps forward, you know, we are going to keep moving forward. Um, from our DEI initiative, you know, we created the a Black Faculty Association and a Hispanic Faculty Association. But even within those two, we lost the intersectionality, which you had mentioned earlier. Um, my mom is Afro-Brazilian. You know, so not technically Hispanic. So um, again, you know, being able to realize that there are uh, different identities and intersectionalities and going back to your first point, it's not always so easy, even within our own lives to depolarize and pick a side um, and, yeah. and, you know, that there is a lot of nuance and gray areas. Yeah, and I think I think the point you're making is, is so important, aren't you? The, the, in my book, I'm writing on diversity in speech. The, once the diversity movement really kicked into, into started moving forward in the early 1970s, maybe the late 1960s, uh, we might date it, it's taken on a life of its own. The mere fact that we're talking about it today, it has changed the paradigm of America so dramatically. They could wipe out every DEI entity in the United States 
and it wouldn't wipe out the diversity movement. Because it, it's, it's just, it has so many startups that have probably started up as we've been talking today that it's got a life of its own. And, and you can sit and say, oh my God, we lost this. Okay, we lost it. We're gonna lose a lot of other stuff down the line. Not gonna worry about it, fail better. There are things happening. I think the deeper question is, how does this, let me go back to dialogue. Now. How does the diversity, the, the very presence of 50 years now moving on 60 years of the diversity movement driving forward with all of its complexities and internal contradictions is changing the way we think about things. Dialogue, free speech, academic freedom. Hey, look, look ah, take a simple thing as this. You now have diversity statements for academic blind the college faculties. The most recent survey I saw about where do faculty stand on this, it's about 50-50. I don't know if that's good. It could be 60-40, who cares? It doesn't make any difference. It's, it's split. Some faculty are opposed, some faculty are for. What's the big divisor? Age. Not race, not ethnicity, not gender, not sexual orientation. It is age. Young people are more comfortable with diversity statements than old people. I should say mainly old white people. Uh, if we be intersectional, maybe old white male people. You know, you're getting, you're getting I'm getting on myself now. Uh, the division's there. The momentum is on the side of youth. The rear guard action is on the rear guard of old creeps like me. But I happen to, and this one I align with youth. So, so, so it's easy to get too upset about certain losses and say, oh, and so we all lost it. No, we're driving forward on all kinds of levels. Uh, Mark Kuban yesterday gave a talk on woke, the importance of woke capitalism. I mean, uh, wonderful. I, I'm delighted. He went for it. He didn't say, oh, we're not being woke. No, he said, I love woke capitalism and came out in defense of it. Uh, so, Momentum is on our side. We just have to keep it going. Well, I have really enjoyed today's conversation. Thank you so much for your talk and thank you for all the contributions. I know we're running um, towards the end of our time, so I do want to turn it back over to Laura um, or just if there's any final comments or, or remarks um, before we wrap up our session. We do have a few more minutes if people want them. Um, if people are formulating their comments or thoughts, um, I can do a little bit of housekeeping um, uh, in the meantime as, as you formulate your thoughts or raise your hands or put things in the chat. Um, so one is that we have a survey um, and I think Sunyata is going to put a survey link in the chat, but I think we're also going to email it to you. Um, there it is about what we where we go from here. Um, the hope for this um, event and this series of conversations is, would be that this was the beginning. Um, I know we find ourselves at the end of two days of really thought provoking conversations, but the idea was for this to be the beginning um, of, um, of a conversation or at least of, of a reframing, if you'd like, of the conversation um, into what uh, people in our positions and the people we work with can do uh, both to promote dialogue and I think to um, right the ship a bit as we're in this time of real partisan divides on whether higher education is very good and what we're doing here. Um, and so uh, I will say that there was a point at a, at a, a national student convening um, uh, at the University of Delaware where some of us um, came up with the thought of, you know, we need to be the knights of badassery coming in and uh, fixing things. So um, in the survey is one opportunity to, um, to give your thoughts on what we should do next. Uh, tights are not required, but always encouraged and welcome. Um, another thing I just want to mention, um, uh, Beth Niehaus, who spoke yesterday, um, uh, has shared in the chat about um, a UC Free Speech Center led um, event and opportunity. Beth, are you of, 
able to just take a second to mention that because this could be of interest to people on this call. She might be away. I will, uh, I will, I will re up that, but um, and we'll maybe send that out. We will be coming up with um, with uh, a set of resources, and we'll be making the three videos available as well. Um, lastly, I just want to thank everyone and, and say if if you are willing to continue conversations and even collaborative work to promote dialogue, I know I know some of the people who've joined us, others I don't. Um, but I think the hope is, as Carlos said, to um, you know do a, do something, leave things better for the people who follow us. But um, um, that that is that is the goal. Yeah, I think we'll try and do a contact list. We're absolutely going to do a resource list, um, and I hope that we'll be that that we'll be continuing the conversation. I don't know if anybody else wants to step in and and provide final thoughts. I think I'll stop the recording for that for one thing, but.